Good afternoon, and welcome to Healthcare at the Edge, how network agility enables better outcomes, a health system CIO Media Inc. production, sponsored by Aruba, a Hewlett Packard Enterprise company. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. Uh, you can send in your questions and comments at any time in the Q&A box, and we're going to do a little poll later. So we look forward to you being part of the program. The way I like to set up the screen today is you click at the top in the middle, get that in side-by-side -side mode, then you can adjust the divider to make the slides and the video boxes the size you're comfortable with, and it should say speaker view in the top right-hand corner. Just so you see how we are going to spend our time today, first we're going to go about uh, 35, 40 minutes uh, with our panel discussion featuring Dr. Stephanie Lahr, CIO and CMIO at Monument Health, Jake Dorst, Chief Information and Innovation Officer at Tahoe Forest Healthcare System, and David Logan, VP Strategy, Office of the CTO with Aruba. So I think we're ready to jump right in and get started. Stephanie, let's start with you. You want to give us an overview of your organization and your role. Sure, thanks. So as you mentioned, I'm the CIO and CMIO for Monument Health. We are a not-for-profit healthcare system serving uh, Western South Dakota and some of Eastern Wyoming and Northern Nebraska. We have five hospital locations and approximately 20 clinic locations over several hundred miles of geography. Um, those details today might be a little bit more relevant given the conversation about um, the needs of our, our network, as well as some of the process that we're going through that I think will come up in the conversation, which is basically um, a complete uh, overhaul and replacement of our entire health system network. Okay, lots to talk about. Jake? Jake there you go. Uh, Jake Dorst. I'm the Chief Information and Innovation Officer at Tahoe Forest Healthcare System. We're located in Truckee, California, and we have a, another hospital, a smaller hospital off our main campus in, uh, in Incline Village in Nevada. So we're uh, two, in two states. We're critical access. We're in a rural area um, near Lake Tahoe in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And we are um, basically the, the only healthcare provider for our area 30 minutes um, Reno's about 30 minutes west of us and Sacramento's about 90 minutes west and Reno's is east so so we're in a unique spot up here to uh, provide health care for our um, constituents very good thank you Jake David uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm David Logan. I'm the uh, healthcare CTO for Aruba Networks. Um, Aruba is fairly well known as a uh, mobility and network infrastructure provider. Um, we are a part of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and um, you know our role is to provide secure connectivity capabilities for all of our customers. And healthcare is one of our uh, key industry verticals. Um, where we uh, provide uh, capabilities for great patient experience and patient outcome, uh, great clinician experience, and, uh, and ultimately, um, we're going to uh, really enjoy talking about network agility today because I think that that's what's going to propel us over the next 10 years of, of continued healthcare innovation. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. So that leads us to our first question. Network agility, is it an oxymoron? Can you have an agile network? Can th such a thing exist? Uh, Jake, why don't you start us off? Um, yes, I, I wouldn't say, I said it, it can be an oxymoron. Um, you know, if it's a stagnant part of your infrastructure that you're not actively looking at new technologies and options, then yes, I think it can be um, non-agile. Fortunately for us, we looked at our network um, a couple of years ago and really and looked at it as, do we reinvest in our current stack or is there something else out there that where we can remain agile and remain cutting edge 
as well as saving money. And that's something we found with Aruba. And we were able to replace our wired and wireless infrastructure um, and save money, which then, then really gave us the agility, especially when we came into um, the COVID-19 situation that we're all facing, we were able to move quickly and uh, get people working from home and not really take a hit in our productivity. So I think it's how you look at it. It's If you look at it as a major investment, a lot of places kind of look, it's secondary or tertiary kind of dollars that you look at for your network or it's minimal every year for what you're paying for support and maintenance and whatever your major vendor has deemed end of life that you've got to replace. So I think if you take a little bit more of a proactive approach with looking at your network really as the foundation of your hospital system, you can make it into a, uh, an agile piece of your, uh, of your infrastructure. Very good, David. You know, um, when, uh, when I was early in my career, I had uh, a colleague talk to me about how networking people drew diagrams on whiteboards and on in a Visio that were very complex and how all these boxes connected together. And then the stuff on the outside, like, you know, computers and servers were just blobs. And, and then when application people talk about what they build, it's all these really complex application architectures and the network is just a, a blob that you connect to. So it really is about point of view. Um, as, a, as a technologist and a business leader in, in the networking industry, um, what we found was for our own agility, for, for our ability as a vendor to provide more and more value and more and more capabilities to our, to our uh, end customers, um, we had to build an entirely software-based approach to how we built networking boxes, even if they have, you know, Ethernet ports on them and, you know, access points that have radios in them. We had to, we had to focus on software and, and software fundamentally promotes um, an organization to be agile. And so um, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be an oxymoron, but, um, uh, but, but certainly when we think about it from a legacy perspective, that, that's what people gravitate towards. Okay, very good. Stephanie? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think that, you know, it maybe has been an oxymoron at times, and, um, and yet it, it can't be as we move into the future. Um, as we look at the kinds of devices and the dependency on the devices that we're putting onto networks, it's not just a bunch of, you know, computer terminals uh, hooked up to a network in a healthcare system anymore, which not that that part's not valuable. Obviously, we all rely heavily on an EHR, but with the advent of IoT and so many of our biomedical and other devices now being connected together and fully dependent on their successful integration and management at the network level, um, it's really imperative that agility uh, is part of the future. And I think that's probably one of the main drivers for us in the last year or so, as we looked at you know, the need to potentially replace our entire network, wireless, wired, and even uh, you know, on the data center side. Very good. All right, next question, Stephanie, let's stick with you. Can you share an example of how agility positively impacted your organization? We had discussed beforehand that you are at the beginning of this journey. So you might wanna talk about goals and things you uh, envision being able to do. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great place to start. So I think it carries on from what I was just mentioning, which is, um, we are really looking at the, the future of being able to have all kinds of devices um, that can be connected to the network and really have the network do the lift, the software managing the network do the lift of determining how that should be provisioned, how it should have access, maintaining and addressing the security um, and not having it a require a lot of um, hands-on from our team uh, and and be uh, allowing us to again be able to connect all sorts of devices um, and not have to uh, be working you know and worried that we're going to have elements of of failure and and then that we're going to have to, for example, staff up by seven to 10 people to do that same kind of management. 
Very interesting. Jake? I think looking at where we were able to really see a return on investment for this, you know, maybe it was not monetarily per se, but really just the, the agility that we gained is when we started, when the, the news of the virus started gaining traction you, and you started to realize that there was going to be a large amount of contingent people going home to work. We had to quickly scramble in IT to figure out, all right, how are we going to do this? How are we going to maintain security? Um, I call it, we were also moving at the speed of administration. So as quickly as administration <laughs> come up with an idea, we were able, and it was really one of the first times in my career, I didn't really have to worry too much about the network. Like I knew we could make it happen, whatever clinic they wanted to open near campus, whatever, um, you know, remote or um, outside swabbing station that we wanted to open, I knew I would be able to do it, which was a load off my mind. And even before things got hairy and Aruba and our partner with RightCore were able to see that the remote access points that seamlessly integrated with our Aruba network um, were kind of flying off the shelves, they, they called me, our vendor RightCore actually called me, which was the first, um, being proactive to say, hey, these things are going pretty quick. Do you guys at Tahoe Forest need us to set some aside and send some to you? And I was like, yes, please. Um, so they were able to get those and sent them to us before we got the, we got the remote access points delivered to us and the invoice came about two weeks later. So it's a trusting relationship, I'll say that. But we were able to get it turned up um, I sent my entire IT staff home because we needed the real estate and they were able to take home their actual computer from their desk along with their uh, voice over IP telephone system. So it, I was comfortable knowing that it wasn't the family laptop that's riddled <laughs> with <laughs> all the kids mm -hmm. games and, <laughs> and all the ransom and malware that's probably floating around there knowing that it was a standard issue computer from our network that was up to date on all its antivirus signatures, et cetera. Um, so that was um, a security comfort for me. So I think that like those types of things that we were able to do quickly and the load off of my mind to know that I would be able to do it. I had partners with Aruba, Rightcore, and my staff that were able to turn it up in like two days and we sent them home and it was, um, it was impressive. Excellent. All right. Very good. David. Uh, so Jake brings up a great use case example. You know, how do you, how do you take an existing network operation and an existing network architecture and extend it to a remote location? Uh, and, and in his case for, in, 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 uh, in their, their case uh, for remote work, same things happening with healthcare organizations that need to extend their networks into gymnasiums or parking lots to do triage or, or, or patient care due, due to the current conditions. But if you think about it, even um, a bigger picture sense, as the industry embraces more home healthcare and hybrid, hybrid approaches to uh, in-facility and home healthcare, what does that mean from a connectivity perspective? Um, one of our uh, customers and partners is Fresenius Medical Care of North America that operates um, several thousand dialysis clinics. They purchased a company called Next Stage, and they're they're looking to have a hybrid approach of um, uh, dialysis in their clinics as well as dialysis at home. And for regulatory compliance, for security, for performance assurance, to uh, ensure that application stack is working in the home environment during dialysis. Imagine the network connectivity architecture they need to build, um, and so. Look, where computing occurs, where connectivity occurs is a great example. Um, I think an, a, one other, one other uh, fascinating example is the advent of the use of personal mobile devices over the past 10 years. Um, between personal mobile devices being used by uh, healthcare employees, by them being used by patients and family, whether it's to execute a, a mission specific function like a radiology read, when a radiologist is moving from the suite down to the emergency department, or whether it's a patient that's kind of like in a hotel room because they're 
they're they're parked in a uh, parked in, and they've been admitted for some period of time. And they want to get access to their digital environment, their 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 personal digital experience. Um, that's all driven because of the development of the personal mobile device, and that by itself introduces again security, performance, network design. Um, usability, who, who's responsible for the experience kinds of needs and questions and issues. And so, um, uh, you know, agility in the network will drive the ability for the, all these use cases to be, to be solved simultaneously. Very good. All right. Next question, Jake, we're going to go to you first on this. Can you share an example of a time when you wished for more agility in your technology stack? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, for our previously imp implementation prior to Aruba, um, it required a high touch by our engineering task. So we're rural. Um, I've got two great networking folks working for me now. Um, and I think we are very lucky to have them in this area, but the talent pool for, for what is becoming a very complex job even more so with certain vendors um you know that didn't have a didn't sit well with me i knew if any one of those guys hits the lottery then i'm going to be uh, <laughs> i'm going to be i'm going to be in a bad spot um so i think that was like that and it just seemed to get more and more complex it, over and more expensive to be honest so I think that using like the clear pass that came with Aruba and the device insight, clear pass device insight, things that we want to do um, as an organization, I think this kind of uh, with, with Aruba really lowers the, the learning curve. So hopefully I can get folks in here that aren't, that don't need to be um, world-class networking engineers that I have now you know, with massive backgrounds and military backgrounds and, and um, you know, just a, a, a strong, strong use case scenario for, for having to deal with complex networks. I feel like now where I'm at, this is a much more agile stack. It's easier to learn it. Like, like uh, Dr. Lara was saying was it's, it, it takes some of the complexity out of the barriers to entry, I should say. So that's, one of the places where I felt like I wasn't as agile as, as I could have been or should have been. Very good, Stephanie. Um, you may be wishing now, right? Cause you're still at the beginning of your journey. So what are some yeah. areas you're looking forward to the improvement? Yeah, I think Jake highlighted a lot of the um, elements that have been, been driving us as we did our assessment of you know the the network options that were out there and um, and ultimately you know made a decision to not only replace our network but replace our network with a completely different vendor um, than we were using before. There were a lot of pieces going into that um, because that certainly raises the stakes as we go through this next what's going to be a three year process. And so as we evaluated um, the elements that were challenging us, I think Jake highlighted some, some great stuff related to staffing. I don't know that there's any health system um, that has fantastic networking people like flocking to them and trying to, to get jobs um, in a health system for a couple of reasons. One, you know, there's lots of places for a great networking person to work. A health system is just one. Sometimes we don't pay as well as the power companies or, you know, some of those kinds of things, as well as the complexity of the healthcare environment can be intimidating, um, I think, to some people and they just shy away from it. Uh, there's always going to be somebody out there um, who can compete for these technology resources and, and pay them more and steal them away. So whether you're a, a big shop in a big city or a little shop, like relatively speaking, both Jake and I are in more rural areas, um, staff is always going to be a challenge. Um, and then, you know, I think that the as he also mentioned, as we were looking um, at the vendor landscape and we started uh, to understand what, as Jake mentioned, the ClearPass Device Insights was gonna be able to do for us. You know, one of the big challenges we were trying to overcome is um, truly understanding, documenting what's on our network, 
right? Seems like a simple question. What's on your network? Um, that's a really difficult question for us to answer on an everyday basis right now because we don't have the right tools in place to be able to do that. And so I think that's one of one of the elements that we're looking forward to in the future is um, that that comprehensive uh, transparency of being able to document and manage what is on our network and do it simply um, and with as few resources as as possible that still maintains the integrity of really the backbone of everything we deliver. I think, you know, a really important element for, for folks in the um, healthcare IT spectrum to be thinking about as it relates to the network is if your network performance is terrible, if your network experience is terrible, your end users typically are not gonna blame the network because as David mentioned, it's a blob. It's a blob to half my IT team, let alone all of the end users. So when our EHR is running slow or if data is not transmitting from an IoT medical device, et cetera, into the EHR, that's what's getting blamed. That device is broken. The EHR is slow. All of those things are, are blamed on typically speaking the application because that's what the end user is closer to and you end up wrapped up in a whole bunch of difficult and challenging conversations to unravel when in actuality it's the backbone of what's supporting those things and you're giving your applications a bad name by not appropriately supporting them um, with, the, with the background infrastructure that's needed. And it all reflects on the IT staff. <laughs> yeah. Well, there right? is. That. I mean, nope. Yeah. <laughs> right, because that's they know they know that's the place to go to yell. I, you, I don't care if it's the network, the application. That's of no interest to me. Stephanie, <laughs> you know, this is the problem. Um, David, there's there's a lot there. I found the piece about um, the staffing very interesting. Of how it sounds like going with a more sophisticated and agile vendor is going to allow you to have less pressure to carry these expensive and scarce uh, talent. Uh, resources, um, but anywhere you want to jump in on what's been said. Yeah, you know, so in fact, stitching stitching a lot of that together, both both comments from uh, Dr. Lara and, and from Jake. Um, one of one of the kind of kitschy conversations I have that actually turns out to be pretty real with with uh, healthcare organizations and, and lots of other entities is the ability for the IT staff, the ability for the IT organization to say yes. Um, a, a, a lot of times the problems that are described to us either because we're being invited to participate in a new project or perhaps just a new segment of the, of the, um, the, the, the environment. Um, well, we have, we had this, we had this real problem and we tried to move to a, a voice over IP network and a bunch of people were walking around with their personal phones they really wanted to use as a soft phone and they didn't want to burn cell minutes and so we tried to connect it up to the voice network we found we couldn't because our security policies prevented their personal devices from connecting up to the enterprise network where the VoIP switch was etc cetera, etc cetera. and so we get we would get into these incredibly technically deep conversations about why not why not why not and uh, and a lot of times we would come uh, to them and say, well, we're, we're fortunate. We have a, a fairly easy yes answer. It, it, it may re require replacing this or replacing that, but, but once you do that, because of the way we've decided to build our technology, you're gonna be able to say yes a lot. And, and, and that's, you know, as, as a, again, as a vendor reflecting on our history, that, that's been one of the, um, the nice things about our customer engagements is the ability to help the IT organization say yes and not have to say no a lot or not be forced into firefighting mode all the time. That's, that's a great way to encapsulate it. Uh, being agile means being able to say yes a lot uh, and then for it actually to be able to execute on what you said <coughs> yes to. So that's uh, very interesting. Um, David, we're gonna stick with you on the next question. Why should, and well, you know, answered it being able to say yes, but anything else you wanna add? Why should IT leaders work on improving Network agility, you know, Jake mentioned the idea that these could be secondary tertiary dollars. This is almost an after the fact, right? We've got all this stuff we've got to do that's sort of more enticing, interesting to the users, uh, crowd pleasers. Um, so uh, why and how and when 
do you work to use your political clout to reprioritize those dollars? Um, you know, so the, the ability for an IT leader to be able to say yes to their business constituent counterparts and, 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 and to the different lines of business, to the different healthcare departments in an organization, um, it's a, I, I, I still haven't learned this lesson after 30 years in, in tech and 30 years of building networks and building networking products and security technologies and helping applications run on top of things. I, I have these, I have these patterns in my life where I think, okay, I think we've kind of probably seen it all now. We, we've, we've, we've done it all. We, we kind of built enough. We're, 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 aren't, aren't we done? And I am constantly surprised every five or 10 years about, wow, okay, well, I didn't anticipate that being a need. Uh, I, I'll reflect on a commercial example. Um, McDonald's is one of our customers and, and they came to us as part of their, their um, reimagining of their, their business about how vendors of technology inside a, a McDonald's uh, restaurant were going to be able to get remote access to their own technology, to the Viking range, to the, to the sub-zero refrigerators that do food storage, to the, to the, customer, uh, the customer portal inside the, the store. The vendors themselves were gonna be getting access through the McDonald's network into the store facility to manage that technology, manage the IoT network on their behalf. McDonald's was gonna get out of the IoT business. They were gonna stop doing the vertical integration themselves. And I, and I translate that into, into healthcare. And I think about PAC systems and physiological monitoring systems, you know, Siemens, Philips. I think about um, uh, the need for those vendors to even be closer partners to healthcare agencies, healthcare organizations. And will they have the necessity of, of getting into the healthcare network directly to manage their technology on the healthcare network's behalf. It, it's, an, it's a completely inverted model of how we used to think about networking. And so that's one example of a, a use case that introduces far ranging complexities that requires leaders to, to really think about agility. Very good, very good. Stephanie? Yeah, I think if we've learned anything in the past uh, four months or so, is that the future is quite difficult to predict and hmm. the kinds of things we may need to deliver um, six months from now versus six years from now because these investments you don't make these investments and then rip them out in a year and a half and do something different they are long-term investments that need to be scalable to sustain you know the test of time and grow with us as we grow into spaces we don't know we're going to live in and so i mean i think that that's really key because we don't know um, exactly what we're going to be looking to need to do in the future i can look at my network right now and and, and say that you know for example i i can't provide a really good seamless um mobile voice over ip strategy in the hospital i can certainly do it on a on a phone that sits on a desk that doesn't move around. But if I want to do that on a, a mobile platform, I, I don't have the infrastructure set up right now to, to facilitate that. And, you know, seven years ago, I don't know that we thought that that was really going to be a need. And that's relatively straightforward. That's not even innovative. That's just sort of the way the future has evolved. Um, as we think about what new wild and crazy things we might be asked to do in the future agility um, of again that backbone system that allows everything uh, to communicate is really going to be absolutely essential so i mean i think to me that's the why it leaders should be looking at improving network agility i mean there are some things that are maybe more nuts and bolts security the staffing elements uh, improved network reliability, you know, th those things are, are, you know, bread and butter of agility, but I think there's the sort of here and now of agility, and then there's the long-term um, uh, resilience to whatever may come, come to us. Very good. Jake? Uh, well, I have, uh, patient care comes first, right? So that's something that I think that as as Dr. Lara says, in the last four months, there's things we never thought we'd have to be doing. Um, 
that being on the Aruba platform a little further down the road than uh, Monument is currently, we were able to really, like I said, just move and do things that 10 years ago I would have been saying, well, hang on, we got to order a circuit and we got to figure out the networking piece of this. And that, and that's what really showed the value, I think, to not only myself and my team, but to my um, colleagues on the, on the C-suite was when they would ask, Hey, Jake, can we do this? And yeah, no problem. We can move that. We can, we can be as agile as you need us to be. And I think in this, in the COVID times, um, that proved to be a huge asset. As, and then as, as Dr. Lair says, there's like patient trace or tracers, um, COVID tracing, things like that, that you never thought that you were going to have to, to do. Um, with our Aruba infrastructure, everything comes kind of basically turned on. So we can, we can think about things that before I wouldn't be able to think about because the fundamental building blocks of that program isn't there. Um, and then as we move into uh, one of the other things too that, that we, we touched on lightly here as in, in, on this panel was just the importance that the network and the internet and the cloud is now playing in healthcare. I mean, it's huge. My entire EHR is hosted offsite. Um, as you mentioned, uh, PACs, you know, most places have all of their PAC system is, is in the cloud. So I think the, the robustness of your agile network is also part of this. Um, when you start talking about SD WAN and those types of things, making sure that, especially in rural areas like myself, um, you know, built, baking in some of that redundancy and failover is something that is as tell I, one of the things that really, I wouldn't say shocked me, but I was very thankful that the government lifted a lot of the sanctions on the telehealth world for us to move quickly into that space, which I think kind of shocked the government <laughs> as well as how many mm -hmm. people just quickly adopted that, um, that platform for providing care. Uh, but with that, you know, as that platform becomes more and more utilized and important to provide care to those people, the robustness and agility of your network then becomes much, much more important to an organization. Um, and where I was saying things may be secondary, tertiary type um, uh, focus in the past, I think that that will change now that we've seen, um, you know, this, this adoption of the cloud, this adoption of telemedicine, telehealth, um, and that's where agility really needs to be part of it. All right, Jake, I'm actually going to stick with you here. Um, and uh, David, everybody's touching on this, the, the role that software plays in, in network technology um, and what health, uh, what should IT, uh, what should it do for healthcare IT? You know, networking just goes into and goes out. It's just boxes. We just, you know, just connect the stuff together. <laughs> it's open source. <laughs> that's it. We, we're using open source routers. It's all fine. Yeah. WRT. That's it. Uh, I think, you know, I th we've, I've seen that change come to, we're using hyper-converged infrastructure at our, at our um, data center as much as it is now, since we've pretty much moved most things out of it. Um, but I think that that is the future and that's I mean, hyper-converged infrastructure and software defined um, data center type applications have been around for a while and I think they've really proved their worth not only in um, agility but also reducing footprint really reducing the cost of traditional server hardware um, at, from a green footprint from an environmental footprint as well um, and I see that also coming into the networking world like David spoke about as that's really kind of the future. Um, and I think as we move, like McDonald's seems like they're just trying to gear up to put robots all in their, <laughs> all in their restaurants. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's kind of the direction where you see this, the software. I like over the counter commodity hardware because it's cheap. And it usually lasts a pretty good amount of time. And one of the things that used to kill me about storage companies was buying a $2,000 hard drive 
that sold that retailed for 150. Um, so I think as we move into kind of commodity based hardware where the magic and the sauce and the secret sauce is in the software, that to me is exciting. And I think that um, that will really change the industry. David? You know, um, we were, as I, as I reflected on um, a few minutes ago, we were kind of clueless and also a little smart and a little lucky when we built our product architecture um, because we just fundamentally didn't know requirements and features that our customers were going to ask us to fulfill. And, and, and we were really lucky to, to do what we did and, and, and choose a software driven architecture to, to um, really build our product set on because when, when personal devices came out and, and end users started loading their own applications on them and all of a sudden we had all these different application flows running inside customer networks and they were coming to us and said, reflecting on something that Dr. Lair said earlier, we have no idea what's on our network now. We don't know what applications are running. We're, we think our application performance for our mission critical apps is being impacted. Can you help us? We said, yeah, we, we probably can figure some stuff out here. Fortunately, there was this whole industry around IPQOS and doing application layer classification. And so we just looked at what other parts of the industry were doing in software and adopted that into our, into our solution set. When SD-WAN really became very interesting you know, five years ago, and the ability to run broadband internet as a connectivity scheme for a remote clinic uh, or even mobile mo mobile systems are now home health, but you still need some enterprise class capabilities like data center resilience and that kind of thing. Well, you know, we can, we can do this in software. We don't have to build boxes that do these things. And so um, software really is driving all network innovation now whether it's data center or WAN or inside the enterprise campus or supporting next-gen business models, whatever it is, whether you look at it from a business approach or from a technology fulfillment approach, software and the concentration of software is going to solve, um, solve all needs. Stephanie, thoughts? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is, um, you know, maybe something just a little more simplistic, which is, because of the kinds of things that we're doing on the network now. I mean, software is essential for managing, monitoring, logging, alerting, um, the things that are there. It's again, it's not just sort of set it and forget it, attach it and walk away. There are a lot of elements that are happening at all times, whether they're security scans or, you know, different kinds of things that are impacting your network, what's attached to it, should it be, shouldn't it be, uh, how should it be protected when you're running other kinds of, um, uh, of programs. And so, the, I mean, the software, that's, that's the only thing that's going to do that. You're not going to, you can't inherently build that into, into the network itself um, without at least a high amount of, of constant, essentially, human intervention. And so being able to establish, um, you know, the, the parameters for monitoring and, and alerting is, I mean, that, that's, that's just going to be where we have to be. All right, we're going to throw out our, our audience poll now, put it out there. So take a look at that. Uh, most, most health systems have agile networks. So uh, I think I know which way this is going to go, but I would like to see the percentages. So uh, our panelists can vote too. So go ahead, get in there and vote. And then we will discuss that in a minute. I have an audience question uh, I want to throw out there, and, and David, I actually want to get this one in front of you first. Um, is there a non-healthcare industry we can learn from? What other industries do a great job with network agility? So, so Anthony, I look at this poll and I'm going, this is almost like a, do you eat enough vegetables and fruits poll? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> while, while, people are, um, while people are answering, so, um, I think higher education is actually a really good space to look in. When, when you think about the multi-constituency aspect of a higher educational institution, whether it's the, the students themselves being thought of as customers, whether it's 
the, uh, the, the instructional staff, the teachers, the professors, uh, administrative staff, the logistics of running a higher education organization, safety and security, research, technology and uh, technology investment, uh, building new ways of doing things. I mean, uh, all aspects of higher education feels like feels like healthcare to me too. I mean, I, I go to healthcare campuses, like my, my daughter had surgery at, um, at uh, CHOP, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia last year, uh, very, very successfully because it's a really well-run organization. And it's, it's a little city, it's a, it's a community. And, and same thing with higher ed. And, 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 you know, and there's higher education institution strategies all over the map in terms of how they think about their technology, how that applies to organizational design, how that applies to their mission and how they want to fulfill what their constituents need. Um, and so I think whether you're, uh, no matter what size healthcare organization you are, what your business model is, where you are geographically, who your, who your customers are, I think you can look at, at higher educational institutions similarly and, and learn some interesting lessons. Excellent. Uh, let me ask uh, the other, other panelists that, um, Stephanie, have you, have you had your eye on any other industries that you try, try and learn from in particular? Um, I don't know if there's a specific one, but I guess, I guess probably not that I want to plug a particular entity, but I think that, um, more my perspective has been looking to folks like Gartner to help mm -hmm. me understand, um, what other industries are doing. Because when I talk to just other healthcare people, all I get is, is healthcare, you know, opinions and, and healthcare experience. And so I, I think the question in and of itself is, is probably, um, probably the answer to, which is there's probably bits and pieces we can be learning from a lot of different industries, um, depending, because again, from, you know, I, I completely agree with the higher ed side. However, they're not going to be doing some of the same kinds of I don't know, customer service, customer focus kinds of things. Um, they have a very defined population. You're either a student or you're not a mm -hmm. student um, mm -hmm. versus at any given moment, somebody else could become a, a patient or a customer of ours. And so, you know, I mean, I think there are things in, um, you know, in, in a lot of other in retail um, and other hospitality um, areas where not just when it comes to network agility, um, but just in general that we're going to need to be looking at. And, and so that's, again, one of the reasons why I, I use a resource, for example, like Gartner, because I get that experience of understanding and talking to folks that are from cross industry. And I think that's super important for us in healthcare right now, because there are other industries that are doing basically everything we do a little bit better. And we shouldn't see that as a negative. We should see that as an opportunity. Jake? Uh, I agree with those um, industries mentioned. I would also say, um, well, Steph and I were fortunate enough to make a trip to DreamWorks for a day. Um, where they make the magic happen back there. And those, <laughs> those folks were super agile. <laughs> and it was just, it was kind of strange because when we're talking to their CTO, who's was clearly brilliant. They want all of the hardware they buy to be completely maxed out. So if they've got a 32 core processor that specially built from that for them from Intel, they want it at, 32 cores at 100% all day long, um, which is not necessarily what, it was a different way of looking at it in my opinion, because I'm like, I need to have that extra excess capacity in case something happens, but they're building something, right? They're building a movie. So they want every dollar that they've spent on hardware, they want it maxed out and putting out 100% of its, of its uh, capability. So that was kind of cool. And I think in healthcare, if you look at it, I've been in, over 20 years doing this, um, we've done, and Dr. Lar may disagree with me on this, but we've done a pretty decent job. We've catered to our providers. Like we've built these systems to really help our physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs and the folks that care for the patients. We've built these systems to capture as much as we can um, it's not always the best systems if you ask the folks that have to put the 
information into the system. Um, <laughs> however, I don't think we focused enough on the patient outside the digital front door as, as it's being called nowadays. Um, and I think who, people that do a great job at that are casinos. Um, mm. They, they, I think the gaming and leisure industry are killing it. Jake would mention that. Give it <laughs> a I, I, hey, look, I don't have to call a number. Um, but I, I think that they do a really great job at re capturing and retaining loyal customers, um, which is something that healthcare is going to have to focus on in the future because there's going, there, there is a lot of options for healthcare. Um, and I think that we could learn some lessons from the agility that you see. Um, I've, were you with us? I think Dr. Lair was with us as well when we, we went down and we were in Vegas and we toured the um, we toured the stadium down there where the Knights play and it was amazing. Like is the the amount of connectivity that was in that building and basically just knowing people that voluntarily downloaded you know loyalty apps or what have you. They know where they are. They know what they're doing and they have targeted advertising towards them i mean it's really a um it was really kind of a defining moment for me i'm like why isn't healthcare doing this why aren't we saying okay jake you're you're getting up to the point where you probably need a new knee <laughs> like let's start sending you some advertisements um so those types of things and i know hospitals some some of the larger organizations are doing that um but for the smaller organizations that may not have that kind of um, capital to put towards those programs. I think that's a, that's an industry where we can learn from. All right, very good. Let's uh, before we share the poll results, I'm going to have my panelists guess on the number. So, uh, David, let's start with you. What percentage agree with the statement that most health systems have agile networks? I'm going to say it's a thirty seventy split, non agile to agile. So 30% agree? Yes. Okay. All right. Stephanie? Uh, so I was actually very, I'm thinking a very similar number. I was going to say 37%. There you go. 37. All right, Jake, which way are you going to play this? You're, you're a gambling man. You're on um, mute, Chief. I'm 25%, I'd say a quarter of people will say that they have an Agile and probably 75% do not. 25%, well, Jake, you're the winner, but you're still a bit far from the mark. Only 14% wow. think that most health systems have Agile networks. So David, that means there's plenty of work to be done out yeah. there that should make yeah. you guys very happy, right? Lots of stuff to do. Very good, all right. Real quick, um, I want to get to the Ask a Co-Panel. So, David, I want to give you an opportunity to ask Stephanie and Jake a question. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, given, given how IT budgets have, and IT technology controls become so diffuse, where end users are sponsoring their own tech and departments are responsible for their own tech, how do, how do you think about um, getting a handle on operations management? We talk, talk, talked about it a little bit, on security, on overall governance of your IT strategy? What, what, are, what, are your, what are your techniques? What's your frameworks? Stephanie, why don't you go first? Uh, so I think that it, um, you know, we have a, a pretty robust um, governance program and we actually call it demand management so that it's not just about technology, but it's all shared resources. And I think that that um, perspective that we de employed, uh, probably it's been you know, two and a half to three years ago now, has helped um, A, enhance the understanding of some of our executive team um, about what it takes to get a lot of these things done um, and, and brings them to the table more for, you know, again, the general conversation of whether it's a, a nursing initiative that requires no technology whatsoever, just a bunch of people's time and attention from across the organization, or whether it's a, a new software platform or a new technology for a particular area, having them come to one place and thinking about it as 
you know, the kinds of resources we need to share and invest in for the success of the organization and not making it IT centric, um, I think has really helped people have more ownership and not feel the us versus them pull because it's really about how do we truly understand as a, a leadership group, um, what are the resource constraints that we have and how best can we share them and prioritize them. Jake? Uh, yeah, the battling shadow IT has been a, <laughs> a lifelong quest. Uh, what, <laughs> what we've done here um, is I've got a really strong project management um, professional working for the IT department and we, I've really empowered him as well as our executive team to put together a project governance committee um, where that really, it puts the onus of the ROI and um, what do you currently have in place and answering those types of questions at the level of the person requesting it. And some of those never make it past that point because they can't be really shown to be, and especially now, if you're not coming with an ROI or some kind of patient safety fix, um, it's probably not going to get done this year. Um, so that that being in place, it like like the good doctor was saying, it puts the onus back on the the person asking for the project. And if they want it bad enough, they'll go through the the gamut. Uh, <laughs> but if I think you know, as we look at it currently in the current state of affairs, like do you absolutely have to have this to make this um, place either safe safer or save money or make money, one or the other. Um, the nice to have kind of world right now is is not present. So, and I think a lot of people have taken to that. Um, I know the executive team was happy. I know my CFO was happy <laughs> um, to really get a handle on who's bringing what type of projects to the table. Um, and then my IT staff is, ha is in a better place because they used to call them the, the gifts. Um, where they like, oh, hey, we bought this a week ago. We need a server and a, you know, we need this spun up. And you're like, well, wait a minute. So it really involves the um, people, the departments that are effective a lot, affected a lot earlier than later. So it's not easy. I'll put it that way. And vendors. David, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Very aggressive. <laughs> so I get in there. David, I want to give you the last word. We just got a few minutes left. Um, maybe put out some advice there to some CIOs that are listening and are going to listen to this who want to get into an agile framework, an agile network, um, and maybe they are not sure how they're going to get those dollars approved. What are some good justifications to go to the board, to go to the rest of the C-suite, and to explain, hey, you want me to be able to do these things tomorrow. We need to spend some money today. You know, there's, uh, so, so Anthony, thank you. Um, the, there's, the, the, the picture I paint is look for short-term wins. Um, I'm working with the health system right now where their short-term win is actually making basic connectivity, basic mobile connectivity in their existing um, patient care stacks and, and, and patient care environment reliable so that the nurse call system works so that the uh, the, 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 the patient uh, physiological monitoring system works and then look to see how they can collapse vertically integrated technology stacks into something that's a little bit more horizontal and a little bit more multifunction in nature and, and make sure to concentrate on, on a software defined architecture so that, um, so that new use case capabilities that are going to come at them new uh, security requirements for IoT devices or for vendor-sponsored tech, the gifts, as, as Jake out, uh, eloquently described, can be embraced, you know. And so look for the short-term win, go solve some real problems, go, go, give, go get some aspirin, I hate the no. and, and then, But then also figure out if you can make a, make a you know, a, a vitamin into the, uh, into, the, into, the, into the cocktail at the same time. Um, and, and then you'll be a winner. Excellent. Well, that's about all we had time for today. Uh, if you need a, a certificate of attendance 
for your CEU program. You can use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording of this event is ready. If you want to sponsor an event with us, you can check out our website or reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team, and you can go to our site to register for upcoming webinars. So with that, I want to very much thank Dr. Stephanie Lahr, Jake Dorst, and David Logan, and Aruba, a Hewlett Packard Enterprise company, for making this uh, great conversation possible. And I want to thank you for attending our events. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.